I'd like to begin by asking you a question and inviting a response. And I'd like to hear your answer. I'll come back to it to give you some time to think about it too. If you had a farewell speech to loved ones, what would you say in it? If you had a farewell speech to loved ones, what would you say in it? I'll come back to your responses in a second. Today's gospel is part one of Jesus' farewell speech in the Gospel of John. We'll get the rest of it next week. Jesus is giving his speech at the Last Supper. He knows his disciples are bewildered, anxious, and troubled. If you knew your closest friend were going away forever, how would you feel? The disciples don't know yet that Jesus is going to be arrested, tortured, and crucified. And yet at this point, they are deeply troubled. Jesus just washed their feet in this beautiful, intimate experience. And at that, maybe they were confused. Maybe other emotions were stirred up. It was such an intimate experience. Jesus touching their feet, washing, drying, and holding their feet. And in the wake of that, Jesus says, do not be troubled. So, what would you say in your farewell speech to loved ones? Anyone like to share? I love you. I love you. It's plain and simple. I love you. Be kind and helpful. Be kind and helpful. Anything else you'd say to loved ones before you you go home? Thank you. For being my friend, and uh, I'm going to miss you. I'm going to miss you. Love one another. Wonderful. Love one another. In fact, in Jesus' final prayer, he says, Love one another. Be one. Anything else? What would you say to loved ones as a final phrase? Or maybe you have already. Maybe you have at home a little letter <laughs> that will be opened at your, at, at your passing and read. Remember the good things. Remember the good things. Remember the good things. Remember the good times. Anything else? Good. God will take care of me. God will take care of me. Beautiful. Wonderful. Keep my memories alive. Keep my memories alive. Beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing. We'll come back to it again. If, you, if something else comes to mind, uh, we'll come back to that. And please do share. So you'd mentioned lots of beautiful things in your farewell speech. I'm sure some of you recognized how difficult it would be and empathize with loved ones you'd be leaving behind. Jesus does the same. In fact, he starts with this beautiful phrase, do not let your hearts be troubled. Let's just hold that in our minds and hearts for a moment. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Maybe I invite you to say that with me. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Hmm. Jesus goes on. He says, believe in God, believe also in me. I think in a way Jesus is saying, if you can't believe in God, then believe in me because you see me, you've touched me, you've followed me. They know Jesus. They've followed him for years, witnessing his miracles, listening to his teachings, learning from his actions, and they just had their feet washed by Jesus. Jesus is saying, believe in God because you believe in me. 
Now, clearly, we don't have the benefit of Jesus with us in the flesh, but we do believe that God's grace is made real in all of us. God's grace is made real in our loving presence, goodness, compassion, love, and mercy. So we can believe in God because we have each other, and we reveal God's grace to one another. Now, I wonder how compelling that would be for loved ones who hear your farewell speech. I wonder how they might respond if you said, believe in God because you believe in me. I suspect some of them might agree, maybe some disagree, and somewhere in between. I recall a good friend whose grandmother passed away. She died in her 90s, surrounded by a large, loving family. My friend attended the funeral, and it became an occasion for him to reconnect with his Christian faith. He did what a lot of us teens did, reject most things our parents gave us, especially religion. But in his mourning and grieving, something changed in him. To see anew the service, to hear anew the word of God, to experience anew the worshiping community, the traditions, the art and architecture, the music prayers, and the liturgy of the church. It was like an awakening for him. It's not surprising then that Jesus, when he broke bread with his disciples, said, do this in memory of me. I love that response, don't forget me. Jesus is saying the same thing there. He says, don't forget me, and every time you break bread, remember me. It's not surprising then that the risen Jesus was made known to the disciples on the road to Emmaus at the breaking of the bread. Some of the things we do have a powerful way of reminding us of people and events and the feelings associated with them. Jesus goes on in his speech. He says, in my father's house, there are many dwelling places. And he says, I am going to prepare a place for you. For the first listener of, listeners of John's gospel, Jesus' talk of the father's house refers to the temple in Jerusalem, which at this point would have been destroyed by the Romans. Jesus' assurance that God's temple will be realized again especially assures the early listeners. For us, we might find assurance that there is a place for all people in God's house. In fact, the prophet Isaiah prophesies this saying, God's house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations. For me, it's assuring to know that this has no conditions, that my neighbors who are not Christian also have a place in God's house. The prophet says that everyone can bring their offerings regardless of their gods or intentions. How many of you saw the, a bit of the coronation or the coronation yesterday of King Charles III? Um, so in that, at the end, uh, or at the part of the middle of the coronation service, um, there were folks who brought up the symbols for leadership to the king. And the leader, or the people who brought up those symbols were leaders of faith communities. So we had a leader of the Jewish community, leader of the Muslim community, and so on, Hindu community and Sikh. I thought that was a powerful sign of unity in diversity. I thought that was a powerful reminder that King Charles is also the king and serves all people regardless of their religion. I've also recently learned that part of Moravian identity is its ecumenical identity. That is, Moravians are deeply linked to other Christians, so much so that they see themselves as part of the same body of Christ. And not only do Moravians believe in this, but they live it out by bravely working together with other Christians. As I've mentioned in the past, this coming summer, Moravians will be in full communion with the Anglican and Evangelical Lutheran churches in Canada. And the fact that you have me 
journeying with you in worship is a testament to your ecumenism. Uh, Also, interestingly, at the coronation, at the end of the service, there were Christian leaders from different faith traditions that blessed King Charles, including, for the first time in 500 years, a Catholic bishop. So I thought that was interesting, that in this beautiful uh, ritual, that we all come together and recognize and offer blessing to one another. Here's a fun fact and your Greek lesson for the day. The word ecumenical comes from the Greek word oikos, which means, does anyone know? House. So in a way, to say that we're ecumenical is to say that we belong to the same household of God. A few weeks ago, as I was studying Moravian liturgy, I discovered your beautiful general liturgy with church litany. In that beautiful prayer, we pray for other Christians. And what's more, we pray for Jews and Muslims who are, quote, close to us in heritage and faith, as well, people from other religious traditions. The fact that we pray for our siblings in faith is a sign that we strive for unity. Back to Jesus' speech, not only do we find reassurance that we have a place in the household, but we find assurance that there is a place for us, for you and for me specifically. And God expects us there, place setting and all. One TV show I enjoy, but don't often admit to, is Downton Abbey. Are there any Downton Abbey fans here? (laughs) That's great. Uh, For those of you who don't know, Downton Abbey is set between 1912 and 1926 in England. It's fictional. It follows the fictional aristocratic family called the Granthams. You also get to the story of many of their staff who run the day-to-day affairs of the family. Sometimes scenes are set around a formal dining table with women wearing gloves and gowns, men in tuxedos, and servants waiting on them. When I think of God having a place at the table for us, funnily enough, this is the first thing that comes to mind. At these dinners, you know who's missing. At these dinners, there are loved ones, and we can catch up on what's going on. But in these stately dinners in Downton, the order of things are displayed from the head of the house all the way down to the kitchen maid. As much as that comes to mind for me, that's not what I hope for in the heavenly banquet. What I'd hope for is a traditional Filipino banquet. Nothing formal, just a family around a table. And we'd have long banana leaves on the table with food on it. No utensils, just our hand. No, no formal, nor formalities, just us being intimate with our food and each other. Oh, and with my mom or grandma, grandmother pulling out good pieces of meat for me. I wonder, what comes to mind for you when you hear that God has a place for you at the table? The next line in Jesus' farewell speech cuts to the core. He says, I will come again and will take you to myself, so where I am, there you may be also. So not only does God have a place for us at his home, and not only does God have a setting for us at the table, but Christ will come back and take us to himself. I don't know about you, but this really does give me reassurance that even if I do not know where I am going, Christ will lead me home. Today, as you notice, we prayed the liturgy for the reign of Christ or the second coming of Christ. In this prayer, we're reminded what else will happen when Christ returns. And I love this. The prayer reads, on the day of the Lord, Justice will roll on like a river and righteousness like a never-failing stream. In other words, at the second coming of Christ, all will be made right, all will be made whole, all will be made good. 
and our liturgy response to this action is apt, we say, Almighty God, we lift our hearts to you, and we faithfully journey to your dwelling place. We rejoice in the promise of your coming of Christ, who has prepared a place for us. Isn't that beautiful? Back to Jesus' farewell speech, Jesus then replies to Philip's question, which basically asks, until your second coming, how do we know where to go? And Jesus replies, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. To be honest, this is another cringy verse for me, mainly because I've heard it so much from Christians who are very exclusivist arrogant and disrespectful. I hear it from Christians who say, you better do it this way, otherwise you're going to hell. They accentuate this exclusivistic understanding of the salvation of God. This is the type of thinking that has led to hundreds of years of Christian imperialism, desecrating cultures, desecrating spiritualities and the faith of non-Christians. When I read Jesus' teaching from an inclusivist lens, I hear the teaching of a universal Christ whose truth can be found in people of goodwill and to varying degrees in other faith traditions. When I read Christ's teachings from an inclusive lens, then God's house is truly a home for all who seek a home. When I read Christ's teaching from an inclusive lens, then anyone who walks a path out of bondage into freedom is living Christ's way. Now, let me be clear. I'm not rejecting the Moravian belief that there is no salvation apart from Jesus. What I am saying is that there are more inclusivist ways of understanding that. The farewell speech of Jesus is good news for all because it is one of unity and not separation. We are called not to deepen divides, we are called to heal them. We are called to welcome those around us who wear different sets of religious glasses and to listen with curiosity as they speak their truth. We may even hear Christ speaking to us in new ways through them. And so, when we reflect again on what would we say in our farewell speech, I wonder what more we might say. Would anyone want to share anything else that they'd say in their farewell speech? I think you captured it so beautifully. Some of you said simply, I love you. Be kind and helpful. Thank you. I'm going to miss you. Love one another. Remember the good things, the good times. God will take you and God will take me. Keep my memories alive. Maybe you might also say, do not let your heart be troubled. Open your heart and see anew the faith that has sustained me. If you miss me, do things that will remind me of you. We will be together again. There is a place for you and for me in God's house. Do not, God does not leave you alone. God will guide you home. Be close to one another. Learn from one another. Forgive each other. Today we've pondered on the first half of Jesus' farewell speech to his apostles. It is a speech full of hope. May we find reassurance for our troubled hearts. Amen.